Hello, Trail Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. Before we jump into today's episode, a few things that you need to know about, and that is that my guest today has an, a free online event coming up where she's going to teach an hour-long class, and I want to make sure that you know about it so you can attend and gobble up all this amazing information that she's giving for free in this hour-long live training that she's doing. In this training, you're going to learn how to choose the right plants for you to accelerate your healing. You're going to learn somatic practices to calm your nervous system and help you to gain access to tools to support your body's ability to heal itself. And isn't that what the Learn Your Health podcast is all about? Helping us to learn how to support the body's ability to heal itself emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Health encompasses our entire life. Taking a moment to see that there's nature around us that we can utilize and connect to, even something as simple as a cup of tea can help us and gently push the body in the right direction. And that's what Dr. Elizabeth Guthrie comes here today to share. So I want to make sure that you know that you can jump in. Go to learntruehealth.com slash plants. That's learntruehealth.com slash plants and sign up for the free talk that she's giving Saturday, August 5th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And if you don't think you can make it, still sign up because uh, a lot of times uh, these talks are recorded and then they send the recording out. This is totally free. She does also offer a course that'll be offered at a later date. But right now, she is just out there sharing and sharing and caring and teaching. This is part one. This episode today is part one. The next episode, I'm going to be publishing episode 507. That one will be part two because we have a continued story, an update from Dr. Guthrie. So enjoy today's episode. Please share it with those in your life who would love to learn how to utilize nature and plants around them to support them in healing trauma and healing themselves both physically, emotionally, and mentally. One more thing I want to guide you to, and that's my last episode, was about using the modern science of ancient wisdom with Dr. John Duyard, episode 505, and he specializes in Ayurvedic medicine and using herbs from all around the world to support the body's ability to heal itself. And he has an amazing store and there's some free stuff to check out in his store as well, uh, his four-day a cleanse, which he gives for free on his website. You can go to learntruehealth.com slash life spa. That's learntruehealth.com slash life spa. And I got for you guys a 10% off coupon code. Uh, every time you order there, as long as orders $50 or more, which I think, you know, if you buy two or three bottles, you would definitely be able to get that 10% off. The coupon code is LTH, as in learn true health. So coupon code LTH, go to learntruehealth.com slash life spa. I love his stuff. His herbs are wonderful. His experience is amazing. So tapping into just again, tapping into utilizing herbs to support the body's ability to heal itself. I have learned from Dr. Guthrie, our guest today, about how to incorporate herbs in my daily life. And it really has enriched my life and my health and helped me as I've been on my journey of of healing emotionally and physically. So I hope that you also gain those tools today as I have. Make sure you go to learntruehealth.com slash plants and sign up for her free class and enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Learn True Health podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 506. I'm so excited for today's guest. We have back on the show, Elizabeth Guthrie, who is now PhD candidate. Woo woo. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Elizabeth, you were on the show five years ago, episode yes. 201. And so we're going to do a bit of a catch up. We're going to play catch up and, and discover what has happened in your life in the last five years. I know when we talked, you were um, just diving even more into the uh, 
studying and now now you're at the point where you're just waiting to hear back you've submitted everything required for your phd so that's really exciting but look catch it catch us up and of course you've published um uh, your latest book the yes. trauma-informed herbalist a discussion around effectively supporting clients who are struggling with trauma which i think that is so cool and you've got another book coming out next year so i'm, yes. I'm sure we'll be hearing you'll you're not going to wait another five years before you come on the show let's just no. put it that way <laughs> but no you've been you've been a, you've been busy both working right working in this right. field and right. also as a student to get to the point where you're um you're now just a few moments away from officially being a PhD. So exciting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so tell us, uh, catch us up, what's happened in the last five years? Oh, so much. <laughs> uh, so I finished my undergraduate work in complementary medicine and went into, I, you know, we had talked that I was interested in becoming a naturopathic doctor and fate had different ideas for me. And I ended up with a master's of public health with a concentration in functional nutrition and as you mentioned, I am finishing up my PhD. I, matter of fact, I say I'm finishing. I have finished all of my work for the PhD. I'm just waiting to hear back about the final exam. The final exam was a thousand questions and took eight, over 18 hours um, to complete. So I understand why it's taking them so long, but I've got my fingers crossed. <laughs> I hear something back very soon because I'm very excited. Um, I worked for a while at the Integrative Medicine Clinic at UAB Hospital here in Birmingham, Alabama, and learned a lot about research and how conventional research strategies sometimes don't match what we see in the field. Of course, some of that I got through my public health degree, but the, a lot of the more hands-on understanding about how to approach natural remedies in research came from that time with Dr. Salvador at the Integrative Clinic. And of course, I have my own practice, and I've recently written, you, you said another book, but this is actually my first book, is The Trauma-Informed Herbalist. Um, and you can read about it at my website, traumainformedherbalist.com. I do have it available for bookstores, so if you're a bookstore owner and want to get copies, you can go through New Leaf Distribution for that. Uh, and yes, I am doing a second book. So many people were fascinated by the chapter on aromatherapy that I actually, I originally had kind of a companion guide to this that was going to come out, but so many people came to me about the aromatherapy and said, I really want to understand more. So I put the companion guide to the side and started work on the uh, trauma and essential oils book that will be out in April of 2023. Well, I said another because I've um, I, I didn't know if you knew, but I looked into this crystal ball and you've published many books in your life. And <laughs> so I just I just got confused as to which one was the first one. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, I've written so much, but this is my first real book. So. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Well, and it's such a labor of love. And I yeah. love that you got <laughs> feedback. And so that you're just taking the feedback and you know what to write next based on the feedback. Um, I think that books on aromatherapy are really important because it's such an underutilized modality. Back when I was a teenager, uh, I had such a really fun and interesting childhood. Now looking back um, as an adult, and as a mom, I'm looking back. And as a teenager, um, my mom introduced me to her friend who ran a holistic spa. And back then that wasn't really as common, but it was it was called Beauty Comes Naturally and it was 100% organic, natural. This is back in the 90s uh, right. spa and there's no chemicals and everything like that. And so I interviewed for a job there, a summer job. And every summer I worked there uh, and I studied and learned about essential oils because that we had a bunch of them. And I was also I was a receptionist and I was also the salesperson, like just helping people buy stuff. And there's all kinds of um, goodies. You would love this. You'd love the spa because it was Aww. more like a, it was more kind of like a health food store mixed with right. a spa. Right. And, right. and they she had a bunch of different. This is back when Aveda was like the from the original creator of Aveda. And it was really crunchy. And there was uh, they were focusing on a lot of um, uh, just pure, no, no chemicals. And so, yeah, there's a huge wall of essential oils and different brands. And I started to get a nose for the 
a really high quality because we sort of had low end, me- medium end, and then high end essential oils based on like people's budgets. And you could right. really smell. You can smell the difference. Oh, and yeah. I can till this day, I can smell the difference between a low quality and a high quality essential oil. Um, but I got became really interested when because uh, I thought it was like this is just smelly stuff. Like I didn't know what it was. Um, but one day, one morning, I woke up. And I had gastritis, like I was, I'm f- about 15, 15 or 16 years old. And I was throwing up, I was nauseous, I had a fever, I was really, really sick. And my mom called uh, her friend and said, Ashley can't make it today. And so my my mom's friend needed someone to be there for a few hours. So my mom, my mom who was on vacation, went in and helped out in her store. And then my mom came home with lavender and peppermint from, from the spa. <laughs> And she, and she said, uh, her name was Carrie Foreman. She's, she's still around. Her name's Carrie Foreman. She said, I want you to take some olive oil, because I think that's the only oil we had in the house. Take some ol- ol- olive oil. I want you to put the, the lavender, a few drops in the olive oil, rub it all over her chest and her tummy. And then I want you to brew some hot water, put one or two drops of the peppermint in the water and let her smell it and let her sip it. Now, I, I had been nonstop vomiting. I immediately, once I smelled the peppermint and sipped it, the vomiting stopped. Once she rubbed the lavender on my chest and my tummy, I, I fell asleep. When I woke up, the fever had broken and I was fine. And of course, I spent the rest of the day like resting because I was like pretty right. intense. But that quick of a transformation, like for me in the past, um, homeopathy was very quick for me to have that kind of effect. But have essential oils go boom, like nausea gone, boom, fall asleep, boom, fever broke. I like it was supporting my body's own healing mechanism. And that's when I became obsessed with learning and studying it. And I I loved it. So anytime someone came in the spa, I was like, you have to try this. You have to smell it. You know, (laughs) like, did you know this absorbs into your skin and goes into your lymph system? And it it helps with the communication between cells and it's it's antimicrobial. And I'd go on and on and on a geek out. Well, as you as uh, you and any listener knows, I just like geek out on all this health stuff. But can you imagine like this teenager just going on and on about how cool? (laughs) people would walk out having bought hundreds of dollars i mean carrie the owner must have loved it i I sold hundreds and hundreds of dollars every day of these essential oils but it's i believed in them and it's it's herbal medicine but because they're sold in spas and they smell good and it's kind of fun and we 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 think about it oh this is like a massage oil right this is like a you know we it's not even an oil which is it's a misnomer but um we give it this idea that it's some kind of you know frou-frou luxury spa thing when right. it's in fact really really concentrated powerful herbal medicine right so i'd love for you today since you know that's something you're working on for your next book and it's in the trauma-informed herbalist i'd love definitely for you to to talk a bit more about that because we all we all want to learn more about essential oils it's 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 easy herbal medicine that you can practice at home that you can use at home um that's already made for you as opposed to uh having to like i don't know get a bunch of leaves and brew right. some teas or you know make some tinctures it's 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 less it's less messy and cumbersome that way so yeah that's right. that's really exciting and and i'd love the name of your book uh because a lot of us have been tr- through trauma the last few years uh, and, and many of us r- recognize now looking back on our childhoods, I think we all, we all have something to heal from. Right. But I'd love to know why you named your book The Trauma Informed Herbalist. Like what happened in the last five years that you went, aha, this is what I'm going to write about. <laughs> oh, story time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It's actually interesting because a lot of people, like you said, like a lot of people see that as frivolous. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we see that some with herbs in general, but really with the essential oils, a lot of people see it as a treat um, Mm. or as something that is not a requirement in order to to heal. And in some cases, it's it might be, you know, a an add on. But in some cases, there are a lot of instances where essential oils are the main thing that gets somebody up over the the hump and back towards healing. Mm -hmm. So I really love that you've mentioned that. For me, the, mm, where to start with the whole trauma-informed discussion. So um, about a decade ago, I was working as a 911 dispatcher. And that alone can create secondary trauma. Mm. At the time, they didn't want to admit it. At the time, they were like, well, you're just listening to stuff on the phone. How bad could it be? Um, And since then, we have discovered that especially since you don't have any control, you all you can do is try to speak to somebody and try to help them 
um, from a distance, but you have no physical control and you're stuck sitting in the chair and you don't have a whole lot of, of any sort of control over the situation and you can't give into your fight or flight response that occurs during some of the calls, there are a lot more dispatchers that have PTSD than people want to admit. On top of that, um, and I loved the job. I loved it. I felt like I was able to help people. But what changed is I ended up in an abusive relationship. Mm. The man that I was with at the time um, kind of isolated me from everybody and was initially just emotionally abusive, but became physically abusive. And I started having a lot of issues after I got out of that relationship. And it's really interesting, again, when you have trauma, sometimes you don't have any of the symptoms until you're safe again, because your body starts to recognize that it's in a place where it can process through some of the stuff. And so, so some of the more obvious symptoms don't occur until you're safe again. Um, and I had my adrenal episodes, which I think we talked about last time. I had my adrenal episodes pretty soon after leaving that uh, relationship and getting out of that scenario. And another thing that I noticed around that time was that I had a change of the way that things like meditation, certain herbs, especially adaptogenic herbs, and the way that my body responded to them completely changed. I've been around herbs for the majority of my life. I was in, uh, I was in some form of energy work from the time I was 12 years old on. We did a lot of Qigong as a child. Um, and I got into Reiki very early on um, in my late teens. And all of that was great. The meditation was amazing. I could take all kinds of herbs and feel like a superhero until I went through trauma. And then some of it still helped, but some of it made things worse. Meditation was one of the first things that I noticed. And I would sit there and I could meditate, but then I would start, I, wa I thought I was, I thought I was hitting enlightenment. I'll be honest, Ashley, I really was like, oh man, I have figured this out because <laughs> I would space out so bad and I would get bragged on by the, the people at the uh, facility because we would have these like all day Sunday retreats where you would sit there and meditate and I could go all day. I could, add, and, but I, what was happening was I was dissociating. And the reason that I found out it was dissociation is because I couldn't come back into my body afterwards. So when you are doing meditation and I mean, most people feel a little fuzzy afterwards, that's expected. But if two or three days later, you're still feeling I, like dissociated from your body, then there may be something going on that you need to try to figure out, you know, is this trauma related? Is there something else? And in my case, it was trauma related. And there were other instances where I couldn't get into a meditative state specifically because my brain was on high alert and was trying to like pay attention to what was going on, not in the room, but actually out around us to make sure that we stayed safe. Um, so there's a lot of really odd things like that where I couldn't refocus on what I was doing because I was going into these heightened states of alertness or full out dissociation. And then the herbs started bothering me. And the first one that really struck me was rhodiola. Rhodiola is this amazing, beautiful adaptogen. I love the smell of the tincture. It's got a very, the, the Latin name is rhodiola rosea. And it has that very rose type scent to it. Very um, mm -hmm. spicy smell. And um, I loved it for after exercise. But what was happening was I would take it because normally you would take it after exercise and it would help you to recover faster. And, you know, it has all kinds of good benefits for your body and everything. But instead, it was throwing me further into a panic attack. And so I started asking around about this, like, are other people experiencing this? And I would kind of get the side eye from some of my mentors and I would get a little bit of a, you know, there'd be a couple of people be like, yeah, you know, I've had something like that happen but for the most part, people were like, that's not that's not what's happening. It has to be something else. You have to be misinterpreting it. And we do that sometimes, right? Sometimes, coincidentally, we'll get sick at the same time we take something and then we'll think that that's what made us sick. And in reality, mm -hmm. it had nothing to do with it. That happens. 
But this was happening frequently enough to where I knew something else had to be going on. And as I continued to study and and I had this feeling of like something is wrong with me, like I am wrong. Here I am. I'm an herbalist. I've done this. You know, I've been in some form of herbalism my whole life, but I've done clinical herbalism for the majority of my adult life. And, and here I am. I can't even take the herbs because there's I have these weird responses to some of them. And then I stumbled across the work of Dr. Peter Levine. Dr. Peter Levine talks about somatic experiencing in the body and and what we feel in the body. The more popular version, which I read after Dr. Levine, the more popular version is Dr. Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. And these people have started to teach us about how our body when we have an experience that creates trauma in our body, the brain and the body are reacting in order to keep us safe. And the body is having these responses that don't have anything to do with you overpowering it with your mind. They're occurring because the body has almost, well, not almost, it has biochemically changed. There are physical changes that occur in the brain when we go through trauma. And it takes time to rewire these things so i do want to clarify real quick trauma when i'm talking about trauma here of course we can talk trauma in the form of if you physically injure yourself you have physical trauma and some people call trauma the event that's occurred but when we discuss trauma in a trauma-informed environment and what i'm trying to help practitioners to um, be able to understand a little bit better. Some people are already starting to to see these things and already starting to find their way with this. But there's a lot of people who didn't even know that this was a thing. And so I'm really trying to help people to understand our, our field. And trauma in, in a trauma-informed environment is defined as the body's response to an event that felt overwhelming. So that's why something that happens to you could cause trauma in your body but i did not experience it the same way and therefore i do not have trauma from it and that's why when i experience something that creates trauma for me the person sitting next to me may have not had that overwhelming sensation they may have felt more in control in that moment and their body may not have created a reaction that is meant to keep us safe but once it goes a little bit too far and becomes a chronic thing, now we're no longer, now we're no longer safe. We're just having the trauma response. So that doesn't make you weak. It doesn't mean that you have failed at biohacking your brain in order to be better. It just means that you went through something that's extremely difficult and that your body and your brain have done what they think is best to help keep you safe. And now it's just a matter of working to rewire what has happened in order to, to help your body know when that response is an appropriate response. That's a, That's really, a lot. <laughs> no, no, it's a great, it's a great way of, of putting it into perspective that uh, trauma is more about whether you feel out of control in that moment. Um, that's interesting because two people can go through the same experience and one end up uh, very traumatized. Just like when people come home from the war, from right. a, a war, not everyone had shell shock. Right. I mean, not everyone went through the exact same experience, but there were some that were a uh, less, there were some that felt were more fragile than others. And I, I don't mean the word fragile in a, like a n negative way. It's just, there are some people who, it really broke them like they really I've I've witnessed I've been with vets who who in full on PTSD, you know, very it's and it, and it takes them hours to get out of it. Right. Um, and, and so whatever they saw or did right in those moments um, was was very was was lasting. Right. And, and then there's others who have been through similar experiences and they 
I always think like, are they just burying it? Like, do, do does everyone come home from the war com- like really, really traumatized? But some bury it, but maybe not. Maybe maybe some are not traumatized that they didn't feel out of control in those moments. So the that's interesting. It brings that, up a, another yeah. interesting point because when I say trauma informed, I don't mean that you have personally been through trauma and now you think you know how to work with everybody who's had trauma. There are a lot of different imbalances in the body that once you've been through it, it makes you a better practitioner. So Mm -hmm. for instance, if you have fibromyalgia and you learn the different imbalances that are occurring in your body that have made fibromyalgia an issue, other people who have similar imbalances that create similar symptoms can be, can benefit from your knowledge. Mm -hmm. But in trauma, my response to trauma is different from your response to trauma. So one vet may bury it down and he may go home and he may be a horror behind closed doors, or he may not be a horror behind closed doors. He may absolutely be bottled up and miserable and sick and can't do anything about it. And doesn't, it's not that he lashes out, but he's so he's almost like imploded and withdrawn from it. Whereas another person may be out in public and having an anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. All of these can be responses to trauma. And so Mm -hmm. when a, when a practitioner has gone through a traumatic experience, that can help open the door to explore the different ways that trauma comes to people. There's different types of trauma and there's different layers of trauma that occur. And depending on the different types, the different layers of person's personality, maybe even their constitution or even their inflammation level Mm -hmm. can change how they respond to these events. And so it's a much, it's a much more broad study than some of, and not that that doesn't, I'm not trying to say that personal experience doesn't matter because obviously my personal experience brought me to this and other people uh, who have personal experience study and understand this and then they're able to help people more. But personal experience is just the first step when it comes to trauma. Whereas with some other things, personal experience can be what makes you the expert in that matter. Well, I really like working with practitioners who have empathy. You know, right. they don't have to have, they, right. they don't have to have the exact same problems that I'm struggling with, but the fact that they've that they're open enough to share what they've gone through that they you know have that level of empathy of understanding like maybe like when because on the outside it's so hard to see what people are struggling struggling with on the inside right? right I just I remember um the first day I left the house and went on my own and ran an errand after our daughter died I I was standing in line at Chipotle and I looked over at everyone. And I texted my my midwife and I said, I just wish I had a neon sign over my head that told everyone how I felt on the inside so that people knew. Because I I looked around, I'm like, all oh, everyone's standing in line, everyone's serving food, everyone eating food. There could be people in this room that are hurting right. as much as I am right now, that are in that are in as much grief as I am. And and if we had some kind of neon sign above our heads that's like kind of like the Sims video game, right. if we just knew. <laughs> If we could just walk around knowing a bit more about the inner workings and imagine if you walked across the street and someone's on the street and and their little sign above their head showed like just how hurt they are. You would just stop and be like, can I give you a hug? Right. And I just wanted that. I wanted everyone around me just to know and and just be share in in what I was going through. And um, and I'd love that. I'd love to be able to just look at others with compassion and be like, Hey, I know what you're going through. But of course we don't have these neon signs above our heads and we all walk around like everything's fine. And if someone says, how are you? We always say fine, no matter what. And, uh, and that just feels so inauthentic. I actually remember in the last year, just hating when people, or they type me, how are you doing? I just, and I would just like, I hate, I hate being asked that question now because uh, you know, do you really want to know? <laughs> do you want right. do you, like that's what I want to say is do you really want to know how I'm doing? Of course, I'm doing much better now, by the way. Thank you. I'm I had a discussion <laughs> yesterday with a friend and I said, you know, I feel like really, really, really happy now. Like I'm I'm in a really good place. But I can look back in the last 
18 months and go like I was, you know, I've been through stuff. And right. now, yes, of course, now I have a, a way you know deeper level of empathy. And I've I mean, I've lost my parents. I've lost friends, you know, so I've been through loss, but I've a, I have a level of empathy. But that's what I want from a practitioner. And I really don't like it when practitioners act cold and professional. I mean, of course, I want professionalism, but cold professionalism distant, and like a distant right. and a wall. I, I, that makes me very uncomfortable because I, right. I feel I don't know I feel judged I'm like I, I feel very like m like I'm the crazy messy mom and this one this person's looking at me going like what's wrong with you why can't you keep it all together <laughs> you know and like I so I kind of want a practitioner to be like a little bit of a hot mess you know I mean right. I, I want them to be good at their job but I, I mean I want right. I want my practitioner to be like you know still having some I don't know baby throw up on their shoulder or something just show right. me show me your They're humanity mm -hmm. show me your real show me your humanity and have that empathy so I, I like that that um, a lot of practitioners feel like they have to wait to be perfect in order to help people. They have to wait. Like I I did not wait to be perfect to start my podcast, right? right. I'm still on my health journey. I've healed a lot and I share about that. I've reversed um, many health conditions and I'm still on my health journey. I'm still not like at like Mount Everest of health, like the peak of Mount Everest. You know, I'm still working on myself, which is, you know, we're, we're all a journey. But I, I, I really got that if we all waited to be perfect. So if you're like someone who's listening as a practitioner or a coach or something, and they're still working through their emotional trauma, it's like, don't wait to be perfect. If you, I mean, if you have the capacity and you want to help people, it's okay. It's you, you like still, or if you're still struggling with your fibromyalgia and you, but you want to help people, it's like, do what you can and let, like, let your, like you said, let your trauma inform you, let your, let what you're healing in, in, and be, be that way of, um, um, of further helping heal other of helping other people heal themselves because you can be that mirror you can show them like hey i can still live a life while i'm healing i can still help people i can still make a difference and so can you exactly so by you being authentic with your practice as a practitioner by you being authentic you you actually encourage other people to heal even further because you allow them the space like it's okay not to be perfect right we can right we can we we all can just be a work in progress together so right. Like and that. that's the beauty of this is when you when you find yourself in a situation where you've had trauma and you start learning about how to recognize trauma and, and how trauma affects people, you start seeing yourself in certain pieces and you start being able to recognize how other people might be affected differently. I mean, when mm -hmm. we look at t trauma, I mean, and you've actually described some different types of trauma here, right? Acute traumas, things that have happened very quickly. There may be repercussions for months or years afterwards, but they've usually lasted a couple of days. They're very sudden, uh, sudden death of a loved one, physical attacks, things like that are mm -hmm. all considered acute trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff that we normally look at and say, ah, that's traumatic. But mm -hmm. we also have chronic trauma. That, mm -hmm. And there's things that can be, they're usually a little more subtle and some people may not be able to recognize them right off the bat. I mean, things like living in an unsafe neighborhood where mm -hmm. you're constantly on alert mm -hmm. and and unsure of, you know, who's safe, who's not. Is that car a safe car? Are they going to give me trouble? That kind of thing. Um, discrimination in general, when you have people who are in groups that are, mm -hmm. are discriminated against, that can create forms of trauma. Mm -hmm. And those are chronic traumas. And another uh, an, another thing that speaks to some of what you and I have been dealing with is chronic illness can create trauma. And a lot of people who have chronic illness have been in situations where they feel isolated, where they are they feel like they cannot get what they need. Um, I, I know from my journey with long COVID this year, I got sick. December of last year. And um, by January, I was having to strategically plan trips to the bathroom. And mm. um, I remember that there have been times where I wasn't in a position to get myself a drink of water. And I had to wait on somebody to be available to help me with that. Mm. And, and those moments can add up. Now, not everybody's going to walk away with, from chronic illness with trauma. But a lot of people who have chronic illness have chronic trauma and they don't even know it because nobody's ever said to them that, yes, this is a form of trauma. Trauma thrives in isolation. 
When someone is isolated, when they feel like they're unheard, when they feel like they're not connected to others, which has also been the reality for most people for the last two years, Mm. trauma thrives in that environment. And you end up with a lot of people who have complex trauma, CPTSD, that's complex PTSD. That's usually when multiple sources of trauma have occurred and it can create other types of symptoms that are very specific to complex uh, trauma situations, like a, a very, very, very strong inner critic um, that, that just berates you. That's a very CPTSD type symptom. So there's all these different types of trauma. And then, of course, that's not even getting into the layers of trauma where you have generational trauma that maybe is something that's happened to your parents or grandparents, and it affects the way that they treat you. Mm -hmm. Um, For instance, I have an aunt who died of leukemia, and I actually share her birthday. And I can tell, looking back on my childhood, how that changed the way that my grandparents and my parents treated me because of the trauma that came from Catherine dying. Mm. And it wasn't bad. It wasn't that they created more trauma for me. It just changed my environment growing up. And there are times where it, it just changes your environment. And there's sometimes where generational trauma begets more generational trauma. And we see that a lot where the abused becomes the abuser. And we see mm-hmm. that through the generations. Um, And then, of course, community trauma and things like that. So there's all kinds of different ways that trauma can occur for people. And the easiest thing to remember is if you feel isolated, if you feel alone or if you feel helpless, those are moments that can make you more susceptible to trauma. And if you have felt that and you feel like you've had trauma symptoms afterwards, you, you may have a little bit, you may not be diagnosed with PTSD, but there may be some trauma things that if you start looking at it like, well, how can I adjust things to bring myself back into a place where I feel more connected, where I feel calm and safe with people, that can bring you to a, a place of better healing. So let's, now that we've sort of laid out some ideas about (laughs) trauma, because a lot of people, like I didn't know, uh, so I was in an abuse, uh, emotionally, sort of emotionally, mentally, never physically abusive, but in some cases it would have been easier if he had just hit me because then I could have ended it. Because like if if someone tries to like physically mess with, I will, I will, I'm a, I mean, I'm not a scrapper, but I'm I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take it. (laughs) I studied martial arts for many years. Right. I'm not looking to pick fights, but I'm not going to, I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to block. I'm going to like f- throw you because I studied jujitsu and right. I'm going to sit on top of you until the cops come. But, uh, <laughs> which is you able to honor your fight or yeah. flight yes. response. And yeah. you can't do that as well with emotional trauma. Right. Right. And so I didn't actually recognize that what I, where I, that it was, I could not really see that it was emotional and mental abuse right. until, until I got out of it. And 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 I had and left the country, moved to it, moved to moved to the states, and then looking back, I was like, oh. And then it started. It started to just like I had to get distance, and then it started started to go through. And I got some. I um, I became a master practitioner trainer of neurolinguistic programming, timeline therapy, hypnosis, and one of um, one of my friends who also went through all the same courses. We'd often sort of help each other like get perspective because it's when it's our own life it's better to talk about it like get it out of you talk like that's why i love you know talk therapy sometimes as long as it's a safe person to talk to uh sometimes it's just good to just get it out because when you hear yourself say it you're like whoa you just get a different perspective and we were talking and i realized like how how just how abusive it was just how manipulative and controlling and how bad it was but at the time you know, when we're young, you just want to be loved. And I just I was like the martyr. I just wanted to do whatever just to you know make him happy, that kind of thing. And then I was like, wow, that was a really messed up relationship for five years. Like right. that was I was like, the like you said, uh, isolating you from other people, like not letting you have friends, controlling where you go. It was it got bad. And um, I'm so glad I'm out of it because now I'm I know how to uh, healthfully enforce my boundaries. So those re- those relationships allow us to learn what we want and what we don't want, and and right. it allows us to learn how to in, uh, how to support healthy boundaries when you know when we experience it because we go, oh that's what I don't want now I know how to teach people how to treat me because I know what I don't want. Right. Um, but so so looking back, sometimes even just listening. I'm sure as people are listening to us talk, 
they're going, oh, wow, maybe maybe I was in some of those situations in my past, in my childhood, like where we didn't feel safe or, you know, those kind of things. So, so we have emotional trauma trapped in the body. I've had several interviews where it's people have touched on this, uh, including um, the the man who invented emotion code, and yes. um, and that's really amazing how he detected and saw in his practice that people had trapped uh, unresolved emotions in the body and how to how to resolve them, how to release them from the body. And then, the, and then the subsequent healing, physical healing that would occur because of that, or their pain, their chronic pain would immediately disappear. Those kind of things was, it's really fascinating. We have to understand that we can see a physical body, so we we on we honor it, like yeah, hey, it's a physical body it exists, but we don't see emotions, like we don't see the mental body, the emotional body, and the energetic or spiritual body. We don't right. see it, but. Um, but it is there nonetheless, and and each one affects our physical body, right? We can we can tell uh, very very clearly that we can hook your body up to machines, watch a stressful movie that's like you know the zombie movie or something, and we can see that just by watch. Even though you know you're safe in a movie theater, you know you're safe if you watch a stressful movie or like Schindler's List or something like just really right. You know, you're you're living through something even though you know you're safe your stress hormones will go up, your heart rate will go up, your body, your physical body is being affected by this experience. And all of us collectively, like 9-11, I know um, some listeners might be too young to remember 9-11 or, or at least have had an emotional impact on it, uh, on themselves. But 9-11, what, for years, I felt that there was a, an impact um, that collectively right. we had trauma. And then in the last the last almost three years now mm. collectively we we are all sharing in some some degree of trauma i i don't believe in um supporting victim mentality i want to support i want I, what i mean by victim mentality is holding on to it and being like this is why this is happening to me and then not um not allowing them the tools not giving them the tools or supporting them in the tools to give step into to allow them to step into their power so that they can heal right so we don't need to be stuck in this trauma right um we i, I like uh acknowledging it or recognizing it is the first is a good is a good step but then of course your whole book is how, now how do you support how do we support them in that to and i don't want to use the word empower because empower actually the root of empower means that they don't have the power themselves and you're lending them your power I want to have help them step into their own power so that they are they're able to use these tools to help them along their healing journey. Um, so I'd love for you to go through some of the, the things uh, in your book that really help people to to step into their power. Right. Well, so one of the things that I mentioned earlier in passing is that I see this as a form of rewiring. Mm. So you're not gonna you're not gonna balance something back real quick. You know, normally when we look at emotional things or a lot of the energetic work that I've done in the past with the chakras and things like that, there's a lot of balancing that occurs. And balance is good. We want to come back into that place of homeostasis or on a more ethereal level, be back in alignment so that everything flows the way that it should. But then there's a rewiring that has to take place when it comes to trauma. So we can get the physical body back in balance, but then we have to really take some time and recognize that whereas a balance may be like a seesaw, you may just put one thing on it and the seesaw comes back to a balanced state. Rewiring is more like, have you ever walked into one of those server rooms? where like all the wires are are like in several different, like they're, they look tangled up and you're never gonna know where one goes unless you follow it with your fingers. The, what, what we do when you have trauma and you have to, to help your body come back to a better state is we're now taking those wires and we're untangling them and putting them back in order so that it's very, very nice and organized. And that takes time. So when you first have, when you first have come out of a situation where you've had trauma, you may start noticing if you've already been using 
you know, herbs, essential oils, mindfulness, yoga, anything, you may find that you're responding differently to the natural remedies. Or if you're a practitioner and you're working with somebody and you suspect there may be some trauma, whether they've revealed it or not, then you may start to realize that they're not responding to the recommendations that you've made in the same way that you would expect. And there's a lot of things that can come into play here. You know, a lot of the times when trauma is involved, it makes it harder for somebody to hold down a job. They may mm -hmm. struggle uh, financially if they didn't, weren't already in a situation to begin with because people who are in disenfranchised groups tend to have more trauma. So there may be things like that that are causing them to not feel like they can afford the remedies. They may not feel like they can keep doing the recommendations that you've made or they may physically be having an odd reaction, an anomalous reaction, if you will, to what you've recommended. And so it's really important to recognize that this is not making an excuse for people. Cause like Ashley said, like we're not looking to, we're not looking to support an idea of victim mentality. Oh, woe is me. Nothing can be done. Look how awful mm -hmm. my life is. That's not mm -hmm. what we're after here. But what we can recognize is for a lot of people, the what we would consider the quote unquote normal options aren't necessarily going to work if they've been through trauma. So if somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I've used this and I'm not getting, you know, I or it's making me anxious, you know, uh, Valerian is one of those that sometimes somebody will come to me and they'll be like, I'm, I'm anxious on it now. And we can shift to other things that have similar properties that maybe will work better for them. And that is the, to me, that is the big thing. And I, I'll talk here for a few minutes about some different herbs and things, mm -hmm. but I really want to get people to recognize that a lot of the times, like what I'm saying about these different herbs can be helpful for people, but we also have to recognize that we need to honor when somebody comes to us, or if you're doing this for yourself, if you're trying some things, honor your body. And just because I said that passion flower is relaxing for the majority of the population, if passion flower is not working for you, change it up and find another nerving. You don't have to go with something just because I think that it's a wonderful option. The, the most important part of this in my mind is to pivot, to be ready to change. If you need to adjust something, adjust it. Mm -hmm. the, the dangerous thing here isn't moving forward and changing and running into roadblocks and having to shift. The dangerous thing here is to stop altogether and allow yourself to stagnate, throw up your hands and say, I give up. I'm not going to mm -hmm. find the connection I'm looking for. So um, before I get into the herbs, I did want to say one more thing about polyvagal theory, because to me, this is the important piece that will help you know, because you could say, well, okay, Elizabeth, like I hear, I hear your truth. I hear what you're saying, but how do I know when something is helping me come into a state that's going to help me heal from trauma? because when I go to my therapist and I talk and I come out of there and I've, I've gone and I have a talk therapist that I've had for, oh gosh, I don't know, six years now. I love her to death. I don't even know how long it's been. It's been at least six years. Um, and that has been some of the best space for me to go and clear my head, come up with new things to help me. And she helps me process through the why of what's occurring. Why is my brain going this way? Why am I having this response to this conversation? Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times the work of what, what is it that I'm experiencing? What is it that I'm feeling? And how do I process what's happening in my physical body is what I'm doing as an herbalist. And a lot of that comes into play through the polyvagal theory. So Dr. Stephen Porges created the polyvagal theory which helps to explain the way that our parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system respond to stress. And this, this is a very, very quick overview. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that this is the end of it. Dr. Porges has written several books on it. Uh, Deb Dana has also written some very practical guides to utilizing polyvagal theory. Uh, for those of you who are therapists or do some of this work already, she's got some really interesting stuff on that. But to summarize, the polyvagal theory indicates that we have three different states of being. When it comes to our nervous system and the response to 
our environment around us, whether it's danger or not, our response to our environment around us is either sympathetic, dorsal vagal, or ventral vagal. The sympathetic state is your fight or flight state. It's where we're heightened. It's where we feel like we can fight back. It's the place where if we can run, we're going to run. The adrenaline's pumping. We're ready to go. The dorsal vagal state is the place where we feel trapped and it's it's the freeze response or in complex trauma sometimes it creates a fawn response which is where um, a person doesn't necessarily want to give in to what their abuser is suggesting but they give into it in order to try to keep themselves safe that kind of comes from a dorsal vagal response as well and that is where we've we don't feel like we can fight anymore. We don't feel like we have the ability to flee the situation. We're stuck and our body freezes up. And then we have the ventral vagal state and the ventral va- If you can't remember sympathetic and dorsal, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Like one just means fight or flight. The other really means freeze or fawn. Again, very simple, but, but for the purposes of this discussion, that that's all you need to know. The ventral vagal state is the important state because that is the place where we are calm, where we are connected, and that's where healing occurs. So when we're looking for herbs and we're looking for essential oils and we're looking for flower essences or activities, we want to find things that help us to return to the ventral vagal state. For some people, this is yoga, right? Movement, Um, and it can be different types of yoga. I have some clients that when we work together, we do a lot of restorative yoga poses and just laying in a position where we're fully supported for several minutes at a time. I have other clients that if I did that with them, they'd run out of the room screaming because it, that, that puts them in a place where their brain starts to, um, it's almost like it starts to come up with all the ways that things could be going wrong. Mm. And because you've calmed everything else down, now the alarm bell starts going off in the brain and it can become very overwhelming. So instead, for those people, restorative may not be the answer. We may go for something like, um, you know, a gentle flow, right? Something that's a little bit more vinyasa in nature. There's a lot more movement to it so that the mind is focused on the movement of the body and not focused on what alarm bells might could go off if we sat there long enough. Mm-hmm. And we do the same thing with herbs. So there are certain people who have a lot of fantastic benefits from the nervines and the adaptogens and depending on depending on how your body responds depending on whether you find yourself in kind of that fight or flight or the freeze and fawn response can determine which herbs might be better for you and that's where a lot of the herbalism work goes for me and i will say this because like it never is as simple as if you're in this group, go to this. If you're in this group, go to this. There are always people where it's the opposite and that's okay. (laughs) What I'm encouraging you to do when we're talking about these things is to try something. And if you find it's helping, stick with it. And if not, then adjust and try something else. So nerving herbs are things like passion flower, lavender, valerian. Um, There's several different options uh, skull cap and hops. These are all different options for nervine herbs that are available. Most nervines tend to be pretty relaxing. There are some stimulating nervines, but most of them are very relaxing. And you're going to find them in like sleepy time teas or de-stress teas. You don't even have to go like not. I love Star West Botanicals. They're probably my favorite herb option in the area. Um, like if I'm going to order something, I'm probably ordering it from star West, but you don't necessarily have to go order yourself a bunch of cut herbs and, and put it together. You could actually go to the grocery store just to start, just to try it the first time, go to the grocery store and pick out a couple of relaxing teas and brew yourself a cup of the tea 
And then spend some time just kind of mindfully like smelling it, noticing how it feels, sipping on it, noticing how it tastes. And spending a few minutes after you're done with the cup and see where your body lands. Mm -hmm. Do you notice yourself feeling a little bit more grounded, a little bit more focused? Are you finding yourself starting to want to fall asleep? That happens sometimes. But see where it lands with your body and spend that mindful few moments seeing what happens with your body and seeing if that's the right tea. And try another one and try another. Try two or three different types of tea. Even more fun if you've got a couple of friends that you can sit down and and talk this through with and y'all can each buy a box and then do like a tea swap where you get two or three packets of each of the teas and then get to, you get to try them and see what tea blends work really well for you. And you might notice what are the, the herbs that we see in those tea blends. There might be certain herbs that you decide, oh, you know what, I could grow that in the garden. And that might be an herb that you keep on hand. But start with the teas. Start with that area and just see, are there nervine teas that could be helpful for me? Can you, now, uh, can you spell this nerve? Is it nerving teas or nervine teas? I, 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 it, I've written it down, but I wasn't sure ex- uh, what you were saying. My southern accent says nervine. It's N-E-R-V-I-N-E. Oh, I N E. Okay. Um, yeah. And if y'all, if y'all hear me on other discussions, I slip into Nervine. It, it, I believe the majority of people call them Nervines, but you will hear me call them Nervines. I'm talking about the same thing. I just, I'm just from the deep South. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's, I, I appreciate all accents. Uh, you know, I've, I've been the, in the States long enough that I can pass for an American, but then once in a while I'll say house or about. Yeah, <laughs> about. And everyone knows where I'm from. I can't, I can't not, I can't say about like an American. It's like about, I don't know. About. How, do, how do you say about? It's, it's very nasally. So you're, you're doing it like in your throat almost and about is up in your about. nasal pass. Yeah. Yeah. There you about. go. About. It feels so weird in my mouth. Oh, so sure. I, I, I appreciate everyone's accent and I love, I love your Alabama accent. That's, it's so much fun. So, ner- <laughs> but ner- ner- Nervine or Nervine. Ner- 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 Nervine. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've written it down. So I know, I know what it is. Um, that's such a great, I love, I love those, those combination teas. Uh, always when anyone in the I mean we don't get sick often but when we do I am right there with the breathe easy tea and the throat coat tea Um, especially if I'm waking up in the morning and I have an interview and my throat if my throat starts feeling scratchy I'm just I'm going for I'm getting four bags of of throat coat tea and throwing them in the pot and making brewing a big pot of it Um, and I really really like those those sleepy time teas they 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 do a number on me I, I'm oh, yes. my, my body's like, yes, give it to me. So uh, I can feel it. But for those who maybe don't like I really when I'm when I'm in uh, the ventral vagal. Sorry, I took I was looking at my notes like ah, ventral vagal. Uh, when I'm in the ventral vagal state, um, I'm I know it. I know it because I've done like in my past uh, years of of like like you said qigong and I'm not right. great at meditating. I've got to admit, not I appreciate those who can meditate. I'm not my brain, mm, but uh, <laughs> but I love prayer. I love prayer and I love yes. I love yoga. That's movement, like move moving and stretching. I'm one of those people. Right. Um. And then. And then I, I love Qigong and, and Tai Chi, you know, just the move, the slow moving and and that that is good for me. I feel a difference. There's I can feel the calmness and it's almost like someone has taken a weight off my shoulders and a weight off my chest. Like it's like, right, oh, like everything my mom used to say, because my mom was like a type personality. Go, 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 go. And she used to say, <laughs> don't wear your shoulders as earrings. Cause you know, Aww. you get, you start getting tense, right? Like you, when you're in that, um, when you're in that fight or flight and your shoulders just get tense and they start creeping up towards your ears. Right. So just like, Oh, just remind yourself, don't wear your shoulders as earrings and just let them drop, let them drop, pull right. them back and just let them drop and relax. But, um, uh, there's a uh, heart rate variability. A lot of the smart watches now um, and little devices, the Aura Ring, all those kind of things can track heart rate variability, which is a really great way of seeing, it, uh, measuring your stress response, measuring, uh, sorry, your stress levels, kind of like measuring um, your basal metabolic rate, right? Now right. we can measure right. our base, you know, base stress rate, our base stress levels. Uh, 
how would you, and maybe you could coach us a bit for those who haven't done years of um, yoga or meditation or Tai Chi, uh, how, and are not as in touch with their body are not as, because stress is not an emotion, right? Like it's easy right. to know, oh, I'm in anxiety. I mean, some, sometimes people don't even know they're in anxiety. They're just like feeling like a lot of stuff, but they're not recognizing what emotion is like, or when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're angry, like we know when we're happy, sad and angry typically, but, but because stress is, is not an emotion, it's a uh, harder to say, oh, I can definitely feel that I'm in, uh, the, this healing state, this ventral vagal state. I'm in the rest right. and digests in state, uh, unless we have these devices like telling us, but could you share with us? what are clear signs that we're in that we've triggered let's say we had that tea or we've gone for a walk in the woods um done a like a two minute hug with the, our loved one that's yes. a great one um yes. what or had a dance a la laughing like rolling on the ground laughing and dance party with your kid you know like that's right like it doesn't always have to be these calm moments it can be loud if you're like right. you know, if that's what your nervous system likes but what what can we see or feel or know to to inform us that we have switched from the fight or flight into the rest and digest? So a lot of the times it's a matter of how present do you feel? And and um, I'm the worst interview guest ever because everything is it depends, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's okay. It Everyone says that. Everyone right. says that. Right? Because we're not cookie cutter. We're not cookie right. cutter. But you're going to give right. us some examples. And, you exactly. know, we're, we're going to so, – everyone takes away what works for them. So don't worry about it. Right. So a lot of the times what I have found to be helpful is how in your body do you feel? Because a lot of the times we get into a place where we feel – calm and soothed but and, and this is uh, even with all of the somatic work that i've done and, and like you said like the qigong and things like that um there are even times for me where i have to kind of check in like am i in the moment or am i going into that dorsal vagal or that freeze response mm -hmm. if i feel like i have control over um how alert i am that's a big one for me. So like if I find myself in a place and I'm like, I don't really, I don't really know if I feel ventral vagal right now, that calm and connected place, I'll see. Like, can I bring myself back into a little bit more of an alert state? And do I have the ability to kind of soften back into the almost almost a dorsal vagal? You know, ven sympathetic and ventral, or excuse me, sympathetic and dorsal vagal responses are healthy responses. But it's when we get stuck in them that it becomes the sympathetic becomes fight or flight and the dorsal vagal becomes freeze or fawn. So if we can find ourselves having some some level of control over how alert we are and how well we're interacting with our environment, that's usually a pretty good sign that we're in a ventral vagal space. So if you don't have any idea and you're out of touch with your body, which is very common, the entero and exteroception gets really messed up when you have trauma. One of the easiest things to do is just notice, am I able to come back into focus or allow myself to kind of relax back into a little more fuzzy of a state? And when you catch yourself in those moments, uh, uh, Deb Dana calls them glimmer glimmers of ventral vagal state, right? Where it just for a moment we feel really connected something just kind of feels right notice what you feel in your body it's like you're saying like are you wearing your shoulders as earrings at that point your shoulders are usually relaxed and they may be back a little bit they may be hunched forward if your posture is generally not good but if if they're kind of relaxed and down notice that and so when you find yourself in the sympathetic or the dorsal vagal state and you notice your your shoulders coming up like you mentioned relax them back down or you may notice that you feel like a warm sensation in your stomach, or there may just be, there's all kinds of different ways that you would feel the ventral vagal state in your body. So for me, the key is noticing when I first have the moments of ventral vagal connection, and then where do I feel it in my body? Noticing when I feel in control of my state of alertness, and then noticing when I'm in that control where do I feel it in my body? And how can I how can I hang on to that for just a second longer? 
you were talking about um you're talking about different types of ways to kind of bring yourself back into that one of the things that we see is group activities connections with others through group activities can be very helpful to bring us into a ventral vagal state and one of my friends dr jessica hoggle just did her phd and her thesis was on drumming so not just drum circles she was actually using drums in a therapeutic setting but mm -hmm. drum circles can help people come into a ventral vagal state. Mm. Yeah. So there's some really cool stuff out there. And if you find yourself kind of getting into a ventral vagal state and you really want to stick with it, you're like, okay, I'm feeling it today. I really want something to help me stick with it. That's when I start encouraging my clients to look at adaptogens. So adaptogens are herbs that help the body to adapt to stress. Um, and there's different forms, there's stimulating adaptogens and there's relaxing adaptogens. But the three that I mentioned in my book are probably my top three favorite for working with people who maybe are dealing with some sort of trauma response. The first one being holy basil, which is also known as Tulsi, and it's not officially an adaptogen for you herbal purists out there. Technically, we say <laughs> that it has adaptogenic qualities. Um, it's not been labeled an adaptogen, but it has very similar qualities. And it's really nice. I, first of all, holy basil grows like wildfire here. I love it. And it's got a very, um, uh, I, I, what is it with me and these kind of like rich tastes? Because I love, I used to love mm. rhodiola for the same reason. Like it has this kind of like rich, spicy flavor to it. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody's dealing with a lot of brain fog, that tends to be my go-to for for them is to, to work with the holy basil. And then we have ashwagandha, which is nice because it has anti-inflammatory properties and we haven't had a ch chance to talk about inflammation yet, but inflammation is a big thing when it comes to trauma response. Um, and ashwagandha is, is really helpful just pretty much in general. It's a wonderful adaptogen, but it also has those anti-inflammatory properties. You're seeing it become a lot more popular now because people have caught on to how great it is. Um, but just be aware that if you go and you decide to get yourself a supplement of ashwagandha, check on the label and make sure it's not blended with other things because there's a lot of supplements that are called ashwagandha. And when you look on the label, it's blended with other adaptogens and you don't want to get rhodiola and, you know, whatever. <laughs> not that rhodiola is bad, but if you have a natural tendency towards that fight or flight response, rhodiola may amplify it. Mm. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to mention was shatavari, which is... It is a, an Ayurvedic herb as well as these other two. And it's it's the one that I go to when somebody has just been beat down over and over and over again. And they're just like, that's it. I'm like, I have, there's just nothing left. Like, I don't even know how to heal at this point because I've been through so much that I don't even remember what it feels like to feel normal. I don't remember what it feels like to be able to have a safe connection with people. So those are my three kind of adaptogens that can help when you're trying to get more and more into that ventral vagal state. I love Nerve ashwagandha. Oh yeah, it's a great one. Sorry, what were you gonna say about nervines? Oh, I was just gonna kind of recap, like nervines have a lot of good relaxing properties. They help the nervous system to kind of um, bring things back into balance. And then once you're starting to get glimpses of the ventral vagal state, finding yourself an adaptogen that you like to help kind of amplify those times when you are in the ventral vagal state can really help, help with that rewiring process. For those who don't know, could you explain what the word adaptogen means in the context of of, of um, turning on the, the rest and digest response? Yeah, so adaptogens help our body to adapt to stress, which I think I kind of said that earlier. But um, when you are, okay, we're getting into window of tolerance discussion now. <laughs> um, and yes. we didn't talk about this earlier, but our, we have what's called the window of tolerance. And if you imagine a tiny little window um, and you have to stay within that window in order to stay in what would be considered the ventral vagal state, adaptogens help to stretch that window out. So there are different things that help to stretch our window of tolerance, right? Like therapists are trained to stretch us to the edge of window of tolerance 
when we're processing through things, they help us to stretch and to kind of build resilience. And the adaptogens do a similar thing on a physiological and ethereal level. It's helping to kind of open up that window of tolerance and make it bigger. Uh, I first learned about adaptogens. I had a friend of mine years ago, a naturopath, who used to call me Ashwagandha because my name starts with Ash. And he'd be like, <laughs> Ashwagandha, how's it going? He's like, actually, I think you should take Ashwagandha. And I love making uh, moon tea. I'll make moon tea with Ashwagandha. And I learned this really great technique where you can make a concentrate of moon tea. So it's a can of coconut milk. I can I'll see if I could put the recipe in the show notes of the podcast. I made a yes. whole video. Actually, actually made a whole video. It's in this um, on my website in this thing called Learn Your Health Home Kitchen. But it's it's um, it's a big a can of the coconut cream. And then we measure out all the different herbs. So then the spices and it's um, antimicrobial. So it's anti um parasitic and it's great for when you want to just bring yourself gently down into the into a wonderful sleep my body responds so well to ashwagandha so oh. we'll do we'll mix in we'll blend in the ashwagandha the coconut cream um and it's like clove some cinnamon some turmeric uh some peppermint Sorry, not peppermint. Uh, pepper. <laughs> I meant to say pepper. I'm sitting here thinking. I'll I'll put the I'll put the whole recipe in the in the in the show notes. Yeah. And so yeah, not peppermint. I meant to say pepper because the pepper you know the right. the, the pepperine Callous. activates the mm -hmm. uh, the turmeric, and and then we blend we mix it up together, and then we, what do we do? We make a concentrate. Leave it in the fridge. It lasts for a while, like weeks uh and then at nighttime i take a mug with hot water and i take a big heaping spoonful of this stuff and mix it in and then if you want a sweetener like you don't have to but if you want sweetener um you can do whatever whatever floats your boat like uh honey or maple syrup or monk fruit whatever floats your boat um to taste uh, but those the the largest uh, herb in there is is the is the ashwagandha. But we do put a lot of other very warm and spicy herbs um, that just it brings a nice heat to the body. And then, uh, it, like I said, it's also it's also anti parasitic. So it's like any, anything anything to prevent worms, you know, and little creepy crawlies we don't want in in our gut. I'm right. I'm happy <laughs> about. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it originates from India. And uh, but I love that the, the making the concentrate. And I learned that from a friend of mine because um, man, sitting there and having like these twelve jars and having to like put it all together every right. night is just like a pain <laughs> in the butt. So just make it once, and then it lasts for a few weeks, and uh, and then that oh man, really just deep deeper sleep. Um, but the first time I did adaptogenics, it was a blend, and what like maybe rhodiola was in it. I don't remember. This was twelve over twelve years ago. This was maybe thirteen years ago. My it made my heart race and I thought I was going to die. I was so terrified. Aww. And and right. uh, so I was like really, really scared for many years. And I avoided all adaptogens until my friend was like, listen here, ashwagandha. You need to try some ashwagandha. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so I was like, OK, not every adaptogenic is bad. But like like you said, try one at a time right. instead of a blend, um, right. because I did that did really freak my body out and I went into complete my body went into complete panic mode right um at a huge adrenaline dump Ginseng and my heart was just pounding too. right so mm -hmm. it's like it's it you know just like we have to think we have to have the same uh reverence and respect for our herbs as we would do walking into a pharmacy you wouldn't be like I'm just gonna take a handful of whatever random pills you know so you don't do that right we have to uh herbs uh have their place and their amazing how like we should reach for herbs first right uh but we have to we have to really be careful in terms of dose and know know how our body responds to it so would you say start out like with a smaller like be more conservative and be like try a teaspoon and then like how, <laughs> oh, how what is it yes dosing. let's talk about dosing okay so first of all let me finish that little bit up by saying that you're right on track with that so a lot of people who naturally run into a fight or flight response with their stress will have that kind of response to stimulating adaptogens mm -hmm. like what you're talking about mm -hmm. whereas if somebody naturally runs into a freeze response if their their normal instinct is to freeze when they're dealing with stress 
then the stimulating adaptogens can sometimes be very helpful for them. So it really does depend on, again, we're back to sympathetic versus dorsal vagal and how it works with the herbs. Um, but yes, dosing. Okay, let me caveat this by saying I have had clinical herbalists who think that I am loony and that I have no business um, suggesting such low doses because there are people who are, okay, at, at least, gosh, those of you who are listening to this and know what I'm talking about, please don't hate me. <laughs> but there are some people who really believe in the physical capacities of herbs, and that's really as far as their training has gone. They are very good herbalists, and if you have somebody that works with you and they go from that angle, I'm not suggesting you should leave. But they don't like the way that I recommend doing dosing because my dosing method is focused more on the ethereal side of things and i believe that you should do a very low quantity to start that's why i start people with teas i don't mm -hmm. start people with tinctures which have a a higher um dose to them um and i i usually when i start people on tinctures who have dealt with a lot of trauma i start with drop dosing or very very low dosing with tinctures um, and the reason for this is that if we're if we're focused on what is my symptom set and is it indicating that there's a lot of heat that needs cooling, then I'm working on cooling herbs and I'm going to be using a much lower dose. Is there a lot of cold that needs warming back up? Then we'd be doing warming herbs and it's not going to need as high of a dose because it is again, kind of energetic based. And I believe that this is best for most people who have dealt with high levels of trauma because like you were talking about where you had tried that adaptogenic blend and, and when you were done with it, you were just like, you thought you were gonna die because it just, it just blew your body's response up. Mm -hmm. People who have been through trauma and their resilience level is, is lower, and that window of tolerance, remember we were talking about that with the adaptogens where the window of tolerance can be stretched a little bit. Usually when you first are starting to heal from trauma, that window of tolerance is a lot, lot smaller. So when somebody's window of tolerance is very small and then they have a few herbs in their system that cause them to have a response that they don't like, Instead of it being a slight inconvenience, it becomes a much larger feeling of overwhelm. And so if we start with a smaller dose, if there is a, a response like that, then there's not as much of a response and it doesn't feel as overwhelming. Plus, like I said, a lot of what I work with when I work with people is more on an energetic level anyway. And I focus on the energetics of things. And, and the funny thing is, is when you do that, a lot of the times the therapeutics tend to fall into place. You tend to end up with the right physical therapeutics as well. But because I focus on the energetics, I do suggest starting with a much lower dose. And that's why I like, if you're going to try this for yourself, if you're not a practitioner, if you are a practitioner, I have classes, we talk about this, you can get the book and, and start there and kind of see if it's something that makes sense for you. But if you're trying this for yourself, then I encourage you to start with teas or just a very small dose of something in whatever form you can, you know, if it's ashwagandha, you're probably going to find it in capsules and things like that. But that helps you to determine, do I feel a little bit of good or do I feel a little discomfort? And determine from there, is that what I want to continue using? If you're feeling a little bit of good, maybe go up to the full dose and see how that feels. Sometimes the full dose can be a little too much and it can start to feel a little overstimulating. And so you find, mm, I'm just going to stick with the half dose or whatever you chose to begin with. So yes, I definitely encourage you to start with a lower dose and work your way up. It's the same thing I do with the essential oils, minimum effective dosing, the smallest amount possible to get the best result. First of all, it's cost efficient. You're not spending a whole lot of money and, and overusing a substance, but you're also minimizing the chance that you're going to have a response to something that makes you uncomfortable and makes you go, Ooh, maybe this is not for me. <laughs> so. Yeah. I like, I like that very solid advice. Start with tea, start with, the tea is like the entry level, nice, nice, safe, safe dose. Right. Right. And and then on the a very other side of the spectrum, it's the concentrate 
which is like tinctures and essential oils. Uh, and so, and the capsules kind of being somewhere in the middle, because then you, you can kind of regulate that. I right. like, once I know I like something like ashwagandha, I'll get a whole bag of it. A whole right, right. Big, you know, organic, well, like good source, big bag of it in bulk, because because then I can make like like I, I shared my my tea with it. And, and you can get a machine to encapsulate your own stuff if you want to save money. Um, but I, I just I'm just throwing it in smoothies, you know, just scoop right. it up, throw it in there, blend it in, cover it up. And and you could do that with lots of mushrooms. There's so many good tonifying mushrooms for for the nervous system. That's right. really helped me as well. Um, do you do you touch on that? Uh, I know because you you do you you teach in your courses, and I definitely want to make sure that listeners know about that, that they can work with you in that capacity. Uh, but do you have anything to say about mushrooms? Yeah, actually, it's interesting because we almost I almost forgot to talk about the autoimmune discussion. So one of the things that we have found and there's there's lots of different things that point to this is that there may be a connection to somebody having this lasting trauma response and having high levels of um, inflammation markers, inflammatory mm -hmm. markers in their body. Mm -hmm. And so we're beginning to see that there's some sort of connection between inflammation and trauma setting into the body mm -hmm. and making it harder to heal from trauma. And I have several clients who we end up, I, I almost, I almost feel bad for them because they come to me thinking we're going to do a lot of like, you know, um, nervous system herbs. And then we end up totally down the immune path. And they're like, what's happening? Because this was not what I had signed up for. But that is sometimes that is what is standing between people healing and or people in their healing is an infl inflammatory response that's out of control and is making it impossible for their nervous system to ever get to a point where it can heal because the inflammation response is blocking it. So a lot of the mushrooms have immunomodulatory properties. And those immunomodulatory properties can help to bring things back into balance and to help with an inflammatory response. Now, of course, there are other things you can do. You can look at healing leaky gut. I know you've had some good people on here talking about inflammation in the past. So y'all may want to look up those episodes as well. But for, as far as herbs, you know, any kind of immunomodulatory herb, a, a couple of cups of green tea, if the caffeine doesn't bother you, if it does, mm. then stay away from it. But the L-theanine in the green tea is a fantastic option to help with calming and relaxing. So for most people, if you drink a cup of green tea, then you're getting a balance between the two. But things like stinging nettles can be immunomodulatory and very helpful. Or like you said, the mushrooms, reishi, that kind of thing can be extremely useful for immunomodulation. So if you think that you have a, an, in, an inflammatory load that is higher, then that may be a good thing to be doing alongside some of these nervous system herbs that we've discussed. Are there cultures that have noticeably lower rates of autoimmune and inflammation do you know of like i'm just thinking mm. for example asia who probably consumes the most amount of green tea right right um they are naturally getting good amounts of uh l-theanine and they're also the love asia loves reishi you know they wi widely accepted and 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 um taken mushroom um, I just wonder if if certain cultures, because they include these foods and beverages in their daily life and in their culture, if they if we can see like, well, see here, these guys are doing this and they have 25 percent less autoimmune than those in America, for example, right, who consume less amounts of, of these things. I just I wonder if we could look at each um nation and see if they're you know which ones have higher significantly higher rates of course who's who's uh tracking all this right and uh right. but it, it, it would be it would be interesting i know that they've done like cardiologists have done studies of um the japanese population versus american population when it comes to heart disease or cancer rates and so i just wonder if we're tracking autoimmune now as well as we track those other um issues 
So it's interesting because as you were talking through that, I was Googling. Ha ha. Ha ha. Google, which is uh, you know, the best and worst thing ever, right? But hey. Yeah. Um, so I actually found some information. I'll try to send you this link so it can be in the show notes for anybody who's interested. But on Statista.com, there is a prevalence of diagnosed autoimmune conditions in selected countries. And it's not very many countries. But since we're talking about the United States and Japan, it's showing a 2% rate in Japan and a 7% rate in the United States. Well, there you go. In 2019. Now, does that mean that it's absolutely that or maybe they're not diagnosing? Like, we'd have to look at their structure and how they chose to diagnose. Oh, yeah. Um, because obviously undiagnosed stuff happens all the time. But I, I right. suspect that you're probably on to a bit of a something there. So. Well, yeah, and and we're seeing how to reverse. I've had several guests on on how to reverse autoimmune and uh, a, a largely diet. Surprise, surprise, that we can largely with diet uh, right. correct a lot of major issues in nutrition, and that's that's why we listen to this show and learn from these guests is how to take control. And that there that word is again the feeling of being in control. Right. Uh, we're, we're giving that we're giving that feeling back to the person who's listening because here there's here's something you can do you can go to the store you can buy this tea you can take it like now they feel like I've got at least I have something I can do right. so many times um, I've heard so many stories of people going to their medical doctor the medical doctor basically saying this is just this is just you're just gonna have to live with this you right. know and just deal with I, it and they act it, it's so frustrating that the medic and Again, not ripping on all medical doctors. You can't do a mass generalization, nor do I. Uh, however, with with our observation of of their education, right? We have right. to understand that their education has informed them, right? And they see through a lens that is different from uh, those who have been holistically trained. It's a different lens, right, to look through, and they really have the hubris to believe that they have the answer and no other answers exist outside of their body of knowledge. Not all MDs, but there's been so many, so many cases and so many people have just have, like you said, throw your hands up and give up because you've been told by the authority that what you have is something you'll always have. Right. And that's not the case. There are so many answers out there. A, a medical doctor that I interviewed um, really interesting. She ended up going hundred percent holistic and became a functional medicine practitioner. Uh, because uh, she became incredibly sick and no medical doctor that she went to could solve her problem. And they basically said, well, you know, clap out, I guess you're just going to have to live with this. And we, right. you know, and, and she yep. was just like bedridden. And so it took natural medicine and she was infuriated because she spent almost half a million dollars and upwards of 12 years of her life becoming this uh, highly specialized medical doctor. And that all went out the window. Yeah, because yep. none of it, none of that education. Now, now that education would help you know, stop an artery from from you know bleeding out. Would help you know help someone recover from a stroke, uh, a heart attack, survive a heart attack. You know, like broken bones and in certain infections. Like there's 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 a place, there's a time and a place for this amazing amazing um, emergency med medicine that I I value and trust, and I will I will be the first person to go to a hospital in those emergency situations right um but but you don't take your car to a plumber why right. why are we always going to the same and this is just this is this is this is the system that we live in because it's a for-profit system so they've set right. themselves up as the only doctor to see and that's why we have to reach out to podcasts like this to learn from people like you uh, so that we can take matters into our own hands and start to explore what we can do on a daily basis to improve our health through nutrition, through herbs, through whatever practices like go for a walk in nature or do move your body in a way that brings you joy. I love I love like the like I said, the Tai Chi, Qigong. You could do it in a structured way or you could just throw on some music and dance. These right. things really do affect your hormone levels. They really do matter. They really can bring down inflammation. There's activities in your life when you go to sleep, when you wake up, when you enter in nature uh, and what you eat all uh, play a major role in affecting affecting your body and, and honoring that. Right. And then and, and this doctor said, I asked her, why is it that so many medical doctors, not all of them, not I'm not throwing them all in the same category, right. but right. so many, so many act as if na natural medicine either doesn't exist or that it's some snake oil quackery and that pharmaceutical based medicine, the allopathic medical system is the only medicine. Right. And she said, listen, 
we invested half like almost half a million dollars and eight to 12 years of our life just depending on how like specialties and stuff invested a huge amount of time a huge amount of energy a huge amount of blood sweat and tears you know essentially and we come out of this believing that we must have been taught everything everything that matters and if they didn't teach it in 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 the la in the last eight years and half a million dollars in education, then it isn't important. And that right. is that is what every medical school is pushing, right? And so what we have to do is just understand that the practitioner you go to is incredibly important. You're the what you choose, and also do not let their opinion be the end all be all um do not let them dictate your healing because I, I i was told i'd never have kids by an endocrinologist after a battery of tests i was told that i was i was barren right and that's ridiculous i you know i we have a wonderful boy that's almost eight years old and um and it was a natural medicine that brought my fertility back and i reversed 100 percent reversed my policy polycystic ovarian syndrome and right. i was told by many people that you couldn't you cannot reverse it and i'm like well I'm about to show you. <laughs> right. And so when you're when you're coming to all of this and you have had trauma and you may find yourself, it's interesting, we we're talking about nutrition and, you know, my master's degree, there was a focus on functional nutrition. Mm -hmm. And there is a strong movement that says that autoimmune concerns, it's a nutrition thing, diet, diet, diet. And that is true for a lot of people. But there's also a lot of people who have trauma around food and they may have an eating disorder or there may be nutritional mm. concerns that make it difficult for them to hit that from that angle and if yeah. that's the case be aware listen to what ashley has said about there's other things there's tai chi there's yoga there's herbs that can help there are ways that you can focus on your health that don't include nutrition now for those of you who are able to work with nutrition and it works for you there are some amazing options there but don't feel like that is it. This is what I'm talking about with trauma-informed care, pivot, pivot, pivot. If you have an eating disorder, or if you have like a lot of people with adoption trauma have concerns around food and they may mm. be fighting food hoarding and things like that. Mm -hmm. And if you start trying to, like there's a lot of restrictive diets that are used to help people heal up leaky gut and things that can actually, you know, activate those responses where, um, somebody now is struggling to fight the need to hoard food in their room because they can't have certain things. So mm -hmm. these are, there's all these little nuances like that where if, if you're listening to this and, and you're hearing the things, don't get stuck on just one thing. Recognize that there are other things that we're talking about and don't hear, oh, well, it has to be nutrition because Ashley mentioned all these other things too, right? So, and that's the kind of thing that, that I'm trying to help practitioners to notice and to recognize because there's a lot of stuff that we've been taught that we see as well this is this is the way right. <laughs> and um and and then we have to recognize that we can become creative and we can still stay evidence informed we can recognize that there's empirical evidence for these other methods that maybe aren't as simple as as looking at something from a nutritional angle they may be a little bit more complex there may be a little more nuance that we have to wrestle with but when we do that we're becoming more accessible for other people so there's mm -hmm. amazing stuff that's being done and what i encourage you practitioners who are listening to this i encourage you to constantly be willing to expand your horizons look at different options learn about new things if you can't carry it then find people in your area that you trust or find people who work virtually like i do that can help you as a as as a referral system build your mm -hmm. referral network when necessary and then of course for the those of you who are listening have hope that there are options available it just may take some time to find what works for you with the situation that you have dealt with and mm -hmm. it may end up being something as like you were talking about homeopathy at the beginning of this and, and it may be something like that it may not be something that has a physical component it may be something that is purely energetic like flower essences which mm -hmm. is is kind of it's not exactly homeopathy but it's kind of a form of it and that's what i work with a lot are mm -hmm. the flower essences and the aromatherapy and the herbs but flower essences help a lot when somebody has struggles on the physical front so yeah bach flower remedies cell salts yes. homeopathy 
absolutely. It, I love that you keep you keep preaching the willingness to try new things, the willingness. Um, I don't want to say get out of your comfort zone because that can like kind of trigger the fight or flight response. But right. but think of it from this perspective of being in control because that right. is a that's called like you said that's calming right feeling like you're in control so you 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 get to brew the tea you get to sip the tea you know uh, you could put on a youtube video just to see like what is a basic tai chi it's it's really fun actually what is it yes. stroking the horse's mane <gasps> i went and did tai chi i remember this was like 20 years ago when i was um heavy into studying martial arts i studied um Okinawan, um, Gojuryu, karate, and uh, jujitsu. And then we did a little bit of gung fu and some tai chi. And, and I go with my sensei to this town that only had like 100 people in it. Small, I was in rural Canada. And it was in the senior center. And it would be a, 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 a senior center um, sort of gymnasium filled with 80 year olds and he would lead the class and it was so cool just to be there and and uh and do this in in rural Canada with a bunch of with a bunch of seniors when I was in my early 20s uh and and, and it feels it feels really interesting just just to because how many times in our life do we breathe and and move slowly like sloths right wow. <laughs> we don't we never do that we mm -mm. never do that but what an interesting thing for our nervous system because we're always especially uh, me i'm busy mom running around doing so many things i always kind of catch myself going wow i feel really um i feel really crazy right now you know what i mean like i feel not crazy but i feel really like a mom with her head cut off like a chicken with her head cut right, off like i'm just right. i'm like i'm making food i'm packing Things food I'm taking the taking yes. the kid here doing homeschooling there going to this class going to that class so go 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 and i feel really productive and great but but that is that even though you're still having fun and being productive how many times are we um surviving on f fight or flight and how many right. women i've talked to believe that I need this fight. I need this adrenaline. I need this cortisol right. to get through the day. Keep I going. need to be yes. in fight or flight to get through the day to be productive. And they think they, they need it to be productive. And so I, um, to do something like, uh, Tai Chi or Qigong where you act where you intentionally move slow, which is something we don't do. We don't intentionally move slow. And you intentionally breathe uh controlled and deep and really oxygenate your body, especially right. the last few years. So many of us um really do need that. And then and what happens is the nervous system goes, Oh, okay, okay. This is like we're not we're not freaking out, we're not putting out fires. Wow, we're not putting out fires. There's no fires to put out. Oh, and then you just feel your body come in, like you said, come into the now and relax. And if you can hold on to that while you're doing, while you're being busy through the day, you, not only will you really enjoy being productive, um, you'll just be, like you said, centered, calm in the now, and you can be busy and productive, but holding on to that, um, telling your body, holding on to that state where you're telling your body, telling your nervous system that everything's okay. Right. that you're safe, that everything is fine, that you're safe. So you don't have to trigger the fight or flight and your body can continue healing and assimilating food, uh, being in fight or flight. It's like you, you lose your, you, sometimes we lose our um, hunger or when we eat, it sits in our stomach, just like a, a pit in our stomach because right. our body's not digesting. You're not digesting when you're in fight or flight. And so if you can eat a meal and, and you feel like you really digest it, it's not sitting there. It's not just stagnating in your, in your, in your gut. Um, you, that is so good because then your body's able to assimilate those nutrients. Uh, so I love the little, I love the tips you gave us. Start with the tea, then then get experimental, but have fun with it. Choose something that you don't feel is scary. Just, but try try new things from the standpoint of this is going to be fun. This is going to be experiment. Maybe include your girlfriends, like you said. Everyone buys a different tea, and you can all share with each other. I love that. Or essential oils. You you're, you and your friends could pick some different essential oils and and share them and. Um, you know, have a have an essential oils party. Uh, there's there's so much. There's so many things that we can do together to make right. it fun. Making it fun is not uh, triggering for the fight or flight response, right? If you can make it fun, then it's um, then it's not threatening. And fun is a healthy yes. expression of the sympathetic nervous system, and that yeah. is. I love that you've yeah. mentioned that because that to me that is so important is to come to a place where things are enjoyable because we want to be able to dip into the dorsal vagal that that what becomes a freeze response when we're dealing with trauma but we want to be able to 
settle in in front of a fire surrounded by loved ones and be in almost a meditative state. I mean, there's almost like a there's almost like a I don't want to call it a dull state because I'm not trying to call it negative, but it is. It's almost like a the mind becomes a little fuzzy and you're just able to kind of sit and be with people. That is a little bit of an expression of dorsal vagal. And we want to be able to have those fun moments of, of a little bit of sympathetic expression. They're supposed to be there, but it's being tempered by the ventral vagal and coming back into that connection. And another thing that um, I mentioned in the book is there are ways to make your own flower essences with the, the flowers that you have. Mm. And so if you have a flower that you're particularly fond of, you can make essences uh, you can do it direct if it's something that's edible or if it's, you know, if it's something that isn't something you should be eating, you don't have to do a direct flower essence. You can actually put the water next to the plant. So there's all kinds of different ways to make this interactive. The book, of course, it, like you read at the beginning, it's called The Trauma-Informed Herbalist, a discussion around effectively supporting clients who are struggling with trauma. But I've had a lot of people read it who aren't practitioners and who love it because I'm not just talking, I am talking to practitioners through a lot of this and talking about being willing to be flexible and find other things. But like my whole essential oils chapter has a whole list of different oils and the ways that I have found them to be emotionally useful for people or the plant spirit connections and digging into trying to find more etheric ways to connect with plant medicine. Um, and when you do that and you are you're reclaiming that autonomy when you are making those choices, that's where you will find yourself able to get back into a place of ventral vagal connection more frequently. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing yeah. these things. Um, I want you to tell us how can we take your courses? If you go to traumainformedherbalist.com, you will see um, at the top of the bottom, there's a place to go where you can you can go to my classes on, or under Empathic Coaches Academy is the name of the, the school. Um, but go to traumainformedherbalist.com. You'll be able to see about my work, about the book, if you're interested. Um, the classes range from like I have one class that's specifically trauma informed aromatherapy. I'd love for us to get on that topic next time because that is a fun topic. Um, and it's a it's a six hour class that digs into trauma informed care from an essential oil standpoint. I'm currently teaching a round of trauma informed herbalism. So you can go and you will find that on there as well. And then, of course, I have my full practitioner program that's available for people who are looking to dig even deeper. Love it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything you want to leave us with? Any homework, maybe? My homework to you is to try something. I'm not going to tell you that you need to go do the tea activity, even though that mindful tea activity is my favorite thing where you, you drink the tea and you smell it and you just spend some time with it. I encourage you to take one thing from this session and go this week and try it out. See what you notice about how you feel when you try it. And from that, what would you do differently or the same? So if it is the tea and you go and you get three or four of your friends together and y'all do a tea swap, um, did it work? Did you find something that you felt was really good for you? How does that change what you're going to do from here on out? Making these small little steps is the way to rewire. Remember the visual I gave you at the beginning. We're not looking to balance a seesaw and fix things overnight. We're unplugging one thing untangling it and plugging it back in unplugging the next untangling it plugging it back in slow and steady is what's so important when it comes to healing from trauma if you have questions don't hesitate to reach out to me at any time i am here to to support y'all as much as i can but i genuinely feel like your best decision is to brainstorm some of the stuff that you've heard today brainstorm it take it and and Try something out and see what you can find that can bring yourself back into more of that ventral vagal connection. Awesome. Awesome. Let's all go do that. I love it. I love it. I'm going to, you know what, maybe I'm going to write, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 
a little sticky note that says uh, ventral vagal stimulation or something like to remind right. me, are you are you in the rest and digest? <laughs> and I'm going right. to put that on like on the fridge or something. Just sometimes it's nice to have little reminders. I, I, I write notes to myself and put them on the fridge um, just to go. Oh, yeah. Put it in the bathroom. Just right. to remind yourself and go. Oh, yeah. Or, or on the toilet. You know, you could put a sticky note right across from, on the hall or the whatever, whatever walls in front of you or near you near the toilet paper. Because, you know, you're sitting there for I don't know, 30 seconds, two minutes, however long you're there. You've got some time to to check in with yourself, check in with your right. body, do some deep breathing, do some, you know, maybe visualize what you want to have happen. That's a big thing I teach people when I teach them to um get out of the anxiety is imagine what you want to have happen because so much we are always imagining what we don't want to have happen which triggers the anxiety response right imagine right. what you do want to have happen today and that just that tells the body that we're not in um we're not in a we're not under attack right we are in a safe place when you can when you can imagine what you do want to have happen even if it's like, oh, I, I imagine the end of your day. I imagine making myself some moon tea tonight, having had a really good day. Yes. That's like just imagine yourself making it, sipping it, having had and smiling to yourself is how great today went. That's it. You don't have to imagine the whole day. Just imagine that at the end of the day saying, hey, this was a really good day. That's enough to tell your body, oh, I'm not under threat right now. You know, take taking those times to to just check in. So I, I love this whole discussion and so many actionable things, so much homework that we can do. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us today. Thank you, Ashley. I'm thrilled that I've been able to do this. This has been amazing. And I hope that as people begin to find themselves more and more in the ventral vagal state, that they're able to make connections with each other. And mm. that's how we're going to eventually heal a lot of the wounds that have happened over the last few years is to bond together in safe and effective communities. Mm. So I, I thank you and thank you to everyone who has listened to this because we've covered a lot. It's been a lot of material and, um, but I, I, you people are, you are the ones that are making this change. We're sitting here, we're discussing these ideas, but when you go out and you make those changes and you start healing yourself and your families and your communities, that's where the real legacy stands. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with PhD candidate Elizabeth Guthrie. Looking forward to part two, which will be the next episode that I publish, in which you will hear the update uh, from this last interview. You can go to learntruehealth.com slash plants. That's learntruehealth.com slash plants to sign up for the free webinar that Elizabeth is putting on. She's going to be teaching a really interesting herbal somatic uh, aromatherapy cl clinical herbalism. It's, it's all really interesting. So if you like today's interview and you're like, wow, that, that, that just uh, gives you a whole new uh, thing to add to your tool belt, this idea that you could add uh, essential oils, teas you don't, you don't even have to get into the heavy hitting stuff like tinctures and extracts you could you can really work very gently with herbs to nourish the body and support the body in emotional mental and physical well-being and so you're going to want to sign up for the free talk that she's giving it's a webinar it's coming up saturday august 5th at 10 a.m go to learntruehealth.com slash plants. That's learntruehealth.com slash plants with an S. And, and just sign up for the free thing. And then even if this is after August 5th, still go to that link because I'm going to see about making sure that we get uh, the link to her ongoing stuff that she's doing and making sure that we link to that because she's giving ongoing talks and trainings. And this is a free webinar that she's giving but she also does uh, paid courses that you can you can take in the comfort of your own home and and you too can become an at-home herbalist to support yourself and your family in amazing health and healing 
Thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you so much for sharing this podcast with those you care about. Please share this episode with those in your life who you think would love to use plants around them to support them in healing emotionally, mentally, and physically. Have yourself a fantastic rest of your day.